We're with the giraffe whisperers today, everybody. Well, Scott Dyson is unquestionably the bird's nest whisperer. Um, we have found a second giraffe. This one, a female. It's shorter than the other one, and I think she's pregnant. And so, with any luck, her little baby will be born fairly soon. And it's a traumatic experience for a little baby giraffe to be born. The female doesn't uh, make any effort to lie down when she gives birth. She just kind of uh, spreads her back legs there and drops the baby onto the ground. And that dropping process is very important. Because the first thing it does, of course, is to wake the baby up and make it take its first breath. A bit like sometimes with the human baby, they need a little bit of a slap on the bottom uh, to, make them, to make them start breathing. Same thing with, uh, with the giraffe baby, and it also ruptures the umbilical cord, which is very important. The amazing tongue that they have. This one is eating some leadwood tree, which apparently is very delicious to her. Let's just watch. It'll be quite interesting to see how long she feeds on these tree, on this tree. She won't finish off the leaves. She'll move off after a little while. I'm sure that's in response. The tree is responding to being attacked at the moment, producing more and more tannins. Look at that tongue. <laughs> there we go. That's enough of that. Now, in theory, I mean, well, I mean, not in theory, but were you to sort of observe the tree there compared with some of the other stuff that she eats, she's heading now towards a jackalberry and probably on past it. There she's looking at us. The leadwood is much nicer for, you would think, because it doesn't have thorns on it. It won't rip at the skin of your tongue. You can see she's given up and she's moved on to another kind of tree and it is indeed a buffalo thorn that she's going for. They tend to be heavily browsed by everything. They taste really quite nice, even to human beings. Don't you think, Vian? Not as nice as your, your breakfast bar, I'm sure, but uh, pretty good tasting. I like it when the thorns are stuck on my skin. You like it when the thorns are stuck in your skin. Well, I mean, that's a little bit odd, of course, but uh, each to his own. Better than having it stuck in your tongue. A constant source of amazement to me that a, a giraffe and elephant and various other animals are able to eat those thorns without harming their inner mouths. Lots of oxpeckers just landed on that giraffe. She'll be very appreciative for the help that they give her. And, eating ticks and taking away parasites. It is a very, very quiet morning out here, I must say. Which is quite nice every so often, just to have a very peaceful meander about the place, looking at the little things. Hmm. Right, so that is the giraffe cow. <laughs> saw one kudu while you were away from us. She went off into the bushes. So we can follow her. Let's see if we can find some others. Now those giraffe cows are seldom on their own, so I suspect they're probably more further down into the bush there. Oh, look, more nyala. We seem to be on a bit of a theme. A giraffe followed by nyala. Same place, everyone, I promise. Ooh, look at them. Let's try and have a look and see what they're eating. I think they're enjoying the moisture on the plants they're eating. And what you'll see is while they look like they're grazing, they're not actually. They're eating the annual plants, the annual forbs on the ground, which are different to digest from the grasses, so they're not grazing. They're almost exclusively browsing animals, are the nyala. Hmm. Enjoying the shade of this marula tree. 
and I think you'll find that the maroon tree that they're under, I'm sure that it's affecting the soil around it, and that's probably what is making these plants underneath it grow where they are. I also think that the effect of having a maroon tree means there's lots of elephant activity around the tree during the, during the time when the tree is fruiting, and that will make the soil around very fertile and therefore the plants very nutritious. Now apparently there was a little bit of confusion earlier on about uh, Nyala versus Kudu. Um, you can confuse them if you don't see them standing next to each other. Uh, but if you see them standing next to each other, they're completely different. Kudu obviously much larger, almost double the size. Less chestnut colored, more sort of a gray brown than that lovely chestnut color that, they, that, the, that the Nyala have. The bulls you can't mistake. The bulls, the bull Nyala are charcoal black with those white stripes and the, some sort of semi-spiraling horns. A bull kudu is an enormous animal with the, the corkscrew shaped horns and they're sort of again a browny gray color rather than that charcoal black. But they are from the same genus, so I mean they're very closely related. Ooh, let's pop across to Scott. He's got a go away bird. Uh, Sit across to him. We'll keep going down this road and catch up with you just now. Now, I can't remember exactly who it was that asked about the grey go-away birds. I think it was Caleb. But whoever you were, you'll know. And this is one of them. So we do get them here. Sadly, we are at full zoom and are quite far away from this bird. So you're not getting the most intricate of details. But it is evidence that they do, in fact, occur here. They've got quite a characteristic crest on their head. Most of the go-away birds and the turacos, their cousins. Difficult to see now as it's grooming itself, but there we go. As it turns its head sideways, you'll see a little bit of a crest, a feathered crest, unlike the bony crest of the helmeted guinea fowl. Cool, well, we just wanted to race you across here to show you the sighting. And I'm now going to continue on up Ledwood Road. Happy to hear that there's been great response with everyone chatting about their bird lists now. And Molly is asking, how do I do my bird list? Is it on an app? And I just use an old book that I tick off all the different birds that I've seen, birds of Southern Africa. But an app would be a great way of doing it. Um, so there's various bird apps that you can get. That would be a good way of ticking off the list. Or just literally a pen and paper or a notepad, even if it's an electronic or digital kind of notepad where you just keep track of how many birds you've seen is useful. So regardless of which way you individually would like to do your bird list, it is fine. Even if it's just a mental list. But I feel that you'll lose track if it is a mental list because there are so many different birds we do get to see. Man has got up to 46 birds. Well done, Monkey Man. Paul is joking, saying that he would like to add some lions to his bird list. And Paul, I hear you. I would love to be able to add some lions and leopards to your birds list. But at the moment, it appears that all that Juma and Arethusa is offering us 
are birds and beetles. <laughs> so there's not much more we can do about that. Sadly, the lions are not here. If they were, we would be frantically trying to track them down. There's a strong chance there could be a leopard lurking amongst us or amidst this area. They are a lot harder to track down and keep track of than the prides of lion who are far bigger and leave bigger footprints in the sand. But it is the way it goes out on safari. You, you, you can't always see the big cats as much as we'd like to. To be honest though, Paul, a big problem that I, I find with the big cats is that as exciting as they can potentially be, the large majority of the time I find them fairly boring. Well, any animal that's fast asleep I, f I find hard to be enthralled by because it's sleeping, of course, and there are very few performers on the planet that can do a good performance while sleeping, none that I know of, if we think of a human context at least. Whereas at least the birds and the beetles are continually doing something, flittering about and on the move. And on the topic of lions, Tom is interested to know how the Birmingham Coalition got their name. And I believe they came from an area or a farm called the Birmingham Farm. All of the, the properties within the Sabi Sands and many game reserves have got individual names, even though they're part of the Greater Kruger National Park, they've got individual names. This is the Sabi Sands Reserve, for example. But within the Sabi Sands Reserve, there's different properties that are owned by different landowners. And this property is called Gowrie. Uh, next property down is Arethusa. There's, there's many different names for the individual chunks of land out here, and one of which is the Birmingham property, I believe. And there's, I think, a Birmingham pride. And um, these coalition members, these five brothers and cousins, must have come from that Birmingham pride or, or Birmingham area. question through on the topic of lions from I think it is ask me and hello ask me what an interesting name you have ask me would like to know what happens to predators when they get old they mentioned that elephants will often die of starvation when they become old once they've worn down all six sets of teeth that they will have in their lifetime and what would be the outcome for, for lions? Would it also be starvation? And yes, a lot of the time it is starvation. Um, as far as I've seen, what's interesting, oh, here's quite a cute little sighting. Directly to our right there, Brian. Oh, no. It's a family of fork-tailed drongos. That's the adults up there. The youngster, which has just flown up and landed next to it. Uh, uh, yeah, all three of them there now. So it was the two adults and one successful chick, but it had quite a mottled coloration and not nearly as black as its parents, but from this angle in this flat light, all you can see is black objects. As I was saying though, a lot of the time I've seen lions also dying of starvation when they become old. And the reason for that is that even though they may be within a pride or a coalition which could be doing exceptionally well, when it comes time to feeding, the strongest and the fittest animals will feed first and feed the most. Cubs will feed last and old, weak grannies and grandpas will also eat last. And I remember feeling huge, huge pity for an old lioness in a pride of 20 plus lions continually be bullied to a degree that 
the sprout of lion had killed a giraffe. I mean, there's so much meat on a giraffe, it's scary. But even still, this lioness did not get an opportunity to feed on the giraffe, not that we saw. And this was right at the end of her career. She was very, very weak by this stage. But that is as a result of her pride not allowing her to feed. And it does make sense in terms of nature. It's harsh, but it does make sense. There's no point keeping an old lioness alive if she cannot contribute to hunting, if she cannot contribute to defending the pride, and all she's doing is eating precious resources, they'll pre present, prevent her from doing that, and that will obviously speed up her demise. So I think just like elephants who lose their teeth and die of starvation a lot of the time due to that, not being able to chew through food, lion even with teeth, but maybe not as much power as they would like, will die of a similar fate. Or they'll be killed by other lion, or who knows, maybe even hyena. I saw an interesting clip of a male lion that was killed by a buffalo. They had a head-to-head, one-on-one feud. And this old male lion was obviously so desperate for a meal that he took on this buffalo. It was a tall order. The buffalo was quite old, though, and it was an epic battle that went on for hours, apparently until eventually the buffalo won and the buffalo killed the lion. So there's many different variables and scenarios that can happen out here, ask me. But starvation, I think, would probably be one of the most common causes of animals to die. The older animals, once they've lost form, especially the carnivores, whose food isn't readily available to pluck off a tree easily like it is for the herbivores. that hyena could possibly kill lion but it is often the other way around and I know Rain who's just 15 years old watched a clip or watched a, a documentary during Big Cat Week on lions killing a hyena and what Rain found interesting was that they merely killed the hyena and then walked off and left it there they didn't feed on it and Rain it's not uncommon for carnivores or predators to kill other predators and not feed on them. And the reason why they are killing the other predators or carnivores is to eliminate competition. Obviously, the less hyena and leopard and cheetah they are running around, the more food there is for lion. So all predators will compete ferociously with one another and kill one another when they can, kill one another's cubs when they can. It just depends on the individual scenario whether or not the predator will decide to feed on its quarry or whether it will leave it there for the maggots. And I've seen countless different predators eating predators, be it a female leopard feeding on the remains of, a, of one of her cubs that was killed by a male leopard and not fed on, or male leopard feeding on leopard cubs that they have killed that they did not father. The same goes for lion. The same goes for hyena. So, again, there are no set rules out here in nature, and just like Ask Me's question about how will lions die, there's no set pathway for any lion, just like there's no set pathway for any human on the planet. There may be general likely outcomes of your life or how you may die as a human, and it's the same for the lion, but nothing will be guaranteed. Interesting stuff though, Rain, and it's something that I've never seen before. I've never seen lion killing a hyena. The closest I've probably come to an animal killing a hyena were a wild dog. A pack of about 10 adults that were seriously showing one individual hyena a very, very tough time. The hyena did manage to escape though. animals come out come out wherever you are ah, I should just ask more often and 
actually stumbled upon quite a large herd of Indiana, and I'm just going to work out where our best position to enjoy a sighting of them is. Let's sneak in here, Let's see if we can't get you some good views. There's like quite a lot of them. Beautiful, and I know you have already seen some Mignala with James, but whilst on safari, you take whatever you can get, and at the moment, it appears that the Mignala are going to be the ones entertaining us this morning. They are one of the most spectacular of animals, or antelope rather. to distinguish male from female, I'm sure, as James may have pointed out for you. The males are a dark chocolate brown once they are old, and the females are this rusty orange color. color. Brian's about to show a big chocolate brown male. Woodland's kingfisher calling nearby. A lot of them, actually. Chick! Wonderful. Well, it appears like the majority... Oh, let's just show you these young males. They're on the way to becoming dark chocolate brown. This is quite nice, actually. They're a hybrid at the moment. But what they will have, even from birth, are those white chevrons between the eyes. So the males have those white chevrons, whereas the females don't. And this one would have been born this time last year. One of last year's babies. So it'll probably still be about another three years before he even thinks of competing for females. Oh, wonderful. Another young male. Okay, well, we're going to send you across to James at one of the water holes, which has been filled up ever so slightly with the rain we got last night. There it is. So we've come to a Treehouse Dam, uh, where the action is being provided by a serrated hinged terrapin. By action, I do mean that term under advisement. Uh, have you got it there, Vian? Yeah. There is the serrated hinged terrapin. And he will be reveling. He would have been under the ground, probably in the mud, estivating until two days ago when we had the rain. Please don't hide that terrapin, you're the only thing we have to look at. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Terrapin. I hope you don't find anything to eat today. Then the other thing we came here to look at was hopefully some action at the weaver's nests here. Now these weaver's nests took a long time to be built this year, and they've almost seemed to be abandoned, and I think it's got a lot to do with the drought and the fact that we've had so little water normally, they'd be swizzling away with their lovely weaver, weaverish swizzling calls, but they, they've built a couple of nests and they seem to have absconded. And those are the nests of the village weaver, used to be called the spotted backed weaver. I don't know why they are not there anymore. The only sort of decent weaver sightings I've had have been at, at the hyena den where a southern mast weaver has built up two nests, trying to attack, attract females there. And um, I watched one female come. She kind of took a cursory glance at his nest and then left him. And um, so he's a bit bereft, and I think he's living there on his own. So the weaver's population is in upheaval, and I think that's probably got to do more with the lack of water that we've had this year than anything else. Heat is starting to build a bit, but if you look off to the western horizon there, you can see that the sky is darkening, so maybe we'll have a bit more rain today. It's rather nice having a 
cloud cover, I must say, of the immense heat that we had when we arrived there. Right, well, let's head on from the high action of the, the treehouse dam. We don't want you to become overwhelmed at the moment, you know, with the amount of action that's going on. find there. Maybe the hyenas will be there uh, and maybe the weaver will be there standing in abject sorrow. There's a bird. Two birds. Chagras. Invisible now. Flying away. There it is again. Seldom see them. Got him. That one is there. Right in front of us there on the dead tree. We hardly ever see these. It's a black crowned chagra. You hear them all the time. You got in there? No. Just down a bit. Down, down. Down. There we go. Ooh, to the right. There. There he is. The black crowned chagra. Beautiful, beautiful call. That's what he sounds like. Except that isn't the black crown chagra, that's the brown crown chagra. Is it? Turn your crown that is black crowned. Phew, thought I'd go mad. And here we, he's a shrike type bird, so he'll be hopping around looking for insects to eat. Grasshoppers, perhaps. And they've got those teeth, of course, the shrikes. Um, well, teeth. They've got eight in front of the beak. I think it might be an Anyala. So we've had a bit of an ornithologically themed drive today. And the rain in England, you want to know what migratory pre uh, raptors we get. Uh, predatory birds. I will get back to you. I just was, there was something walking through here. I suspect it was another Nyala. It was made, put in a great appearance, great performance today from the Nyala. We've had about 46 sightings on those spots. Of about 57. Let's see whatever it was. I'm pretty sure it was a male Nyala. Right, Lorraine. Raptors that come through here that migrate. The step eagle is the most is the impressive fellow. He's a huge eagle about that big. He comes from Russia, from the steppes of Russia, and comes and eats basically termites. You'd think that they'd be uh, killers of small mammals, but they're mainly termite eaters. Uh, then the Walberg's eagle, of course. Um, other eagle species would be lesser spotted eagles. Booted eagles sometimes migrate, sometimes they stay the whole time. Um, those are the main ones. Then the Amur falcon is uh, the most numerous one. They can occur in huge flocks. And they also pick termites out of the sky and other insects out of the sky. It's a buffalo. Steenbok, that is not a buffalo running through the bush. There's the steenbok. There's the buffalo pool. There's a whole lot of them. Let's go through there. I'll drive off road and have a look at so Lorraine, those are the main raptors that uh, migrate. Ammo falcon is a tiny little kestrel type bird. It's only about that big. They migrate in enormous numbers. Paleoarctic migrants, so they go into Europe. Two buffalo bulls. So not really so much a whole lot as two. Oh, don't run away, Buffalo. I've had huge action this morning. Stay right where you are and allow us to view you. Two old buffalo. 
buffalo bulls, excluded from the herd on account of their age. It's very relaxed around us, I must say, which is wonderful. And I suspect they will find themselves, as the heat builds at the Treehouse Dam, they'll find some mud to lie in there. They will be loving the new grass. They're only about 30 feet from us, but the bush is quite thick. Ox peckers. Yellow billed ox pecker, that's wonderful. So those are quite rare. And you can see, I mean, he does have the red tip to his bill, but that yellow behind the red tip is what gives him his name. So if you are keeping a bird list, yellow-billed oxpecker is a good one, especially in this area. I've seen more and more of them of late, which is great, because I know that for a while we, they were quite endangered. very smooth set of horns there, but you can see they're pretty blunt on the end. And these chaps are just, you know, they're a little bit past their sell-by date. In terms of breeding, I mean, not in terms of us looking at them. I still think that they're quite fun fellows. from Gail. I just want to get it again because I'm, I'm I just want to make sure that I get it correctly. Gail, you're in Chicago. We're just going to get your question again. Ah. Now, Gail, you want to know about what animals we used to eat or do eat and could say many years ago, perhaps centuries, what, what animals would have been eaten were all the animals used for food. Gail, um, yes, certainly everything out here has been used for food at one stage or another. Now, the predators, not so much, but buffalo make excellent meat, and as do elephants and hippos. But what you will find, Gail, is that it's, it's an interesting question, because in Africa, we evolved with, uh, with these animals, with these, these kind of animals that people consider to be quite aggressive. And that's because we've been eating them for so many millennia. That's why they're so nervous of us. That's why they see us as the apex predator. So, Gail, absolutely. We certainly ate most of the herbivores. We've been hunting them, and we've been protecting ourselves from the lions. We're probably not eating the lions, but protecting ourselves from the predators, lions, hyenas, leopards, wild dogs, for so many centuries, so many millennia, not just centuries but they are now all very afraid of us. So yes, if it could be eaten, it has been eaten out here. Uh, from anything from the termites up to the size of an elephant have been used for human consumption over the millennia. But remember that, I mean, certainly indigenous peoples of this area in the last half of the last millennium, so say from 1500 to 2000, wouldn't have, would have had an almost negligible effect on herbivore numbers because, you know, I mean, to kill a buffalo, to kill an elephant would have been very difficult and so it would have been a fairly rare occurrence before the advent of firearms and it was only when colonists came through with their heavy weapons, with guns and gunpowder that animal numbers really started to be affected by people. And it's an interesting thing to me that, you know, conservation spaces in South Africa and in Africa are tremendously conflicted uh, or they can be areas of great conflict especially in the 80s they were because local people's needs weren't taken into account and it was ironic that it was local people who were excluded indigenous peoples who were excluded from protected areas despite the fact that it was the colonists that had created the great um, death 
of the numbers of, of animals. So certainly in this area, once guns arrived, he, we, there were thousands of elephants here at one stage. When the Kruger National Park was proclaimed, there were eight, just eight left in the entire area. So great question, and it leads on to some really interesting discussions. Thank you, Gail. All right, let's uh, press on from here, make our way slowly towards the hyena den. Buffalo to, to uh, spend some time with us. Hmm. Siberia, very nice question from you about noises and what are the most, what's the loudest uh, noise that we can hear out here without sort of the aid of wind. Um, Siberia, I don't think it's a simple question to answer simply because we don't really have uh, the ears that hear necessarily all the frequencies. So for us, I think the loudest noise you can hear is one of two things. One is the is a lion roar, which we can hear from, hmm, I'd say, three or four kilometers away. And the other would be the roar of an elephant close by. That's, it can be extremely loud if an elephant is screaming certainly a very primal sound. But the elephants, of course, can communicate with each other over the distances they reckon of up to sort of 10 kilometers, which is six miles, enormous distance. And I don't think, I mean, certainly lions might be able to, yeah, lions can probably talk with each other over the same sort of distance. Um, so it really depends on how good your ears are. So I'd say elephants and lions, Siberia, nice question. to them tend not to make a huge noise. And back onto the subject of food. Ralph in Michigan, you want to know if bush meat is still eaten out here or is it frowned upon? It's becoming less and less frowned upon. Um, Ralph? Um, sorry, I've just got a frog in my throat. <coughs> Not a real frog. <coughs> Although they are out at the moment. Um, Ralph, the <coughs> excuse me, the ecological consequences of beef and uh, certainly pigs and lamb and chicken farming are becoming more and more apparent. And certainly the general public is becoming much more aware of it. Much more sustainable options are you know, venison farms. So there are places where you they will farm kudu and farm um, and parlor especially and, uh, and sort of uh, harvest them for meat. And that tends to be, because it's done on natural felt or natural rangeland, tends to be a much more sustainable situation. So bush meat, I mean, yeah, I mean, you don't come into the Kruger Park and eat any of the animals here. But you can certainly, it's easy to buy venison in South Africa. It's much better for you, and it's much better for the environment. So it's becoming far, far more popular. Definitely not frowned upon at all anymore, Ralph. Um, certainly put, pulling bushmeat out of the Kruger National Park would be frowned upon heavily. I think we've got so used to eating such an enormous amount of meat. Jenny, we were looking at some uh, some buffalo bulls, which actually buffalo make very good meat as well. Um, but it's quite tough. You really got to know how to cook it. And you want to know why those buffalo bulls are called Daga boys? Well, what does Daga mean? And you'll see it's spelled D-A-G-G-A, that is incorrect. It comes from the Zulu word umdaga, which means mud. U-M-D-A-K-A, -A. The, the letter K is pronounced G in Zulu, unless it's got an H behind it, but we don't need to go into the linguistics of that. Southern Africa. Uh, umdaga means mud, and it's because those buffalo bulls go and spend so much time in the mud. And I think those three or four that were there, I saw some at the back, who go towards Treehouse Dam, and I think they'll sit in the mud for much of the day. So when you see them, they're often covered in mud, and that's why they're called Daga boys. Thank you, Jenny. It's one of those things we also take for granted, sort of, that people will understand. 
I just know. Yeah, you use the term just now, don't you? Stop listening to me. Andy, you want to know about endangered animals and how many endangered ones we have? Distressingly more than we'd want. Uh, and I don't mean that in terms of the animals, I mean that in terms of the number of species that are endangered. Uh, leopards, for example, very vulnerable. Uh, lots of different subspecies around the world. Most of them are critically endangered. The ones here are the safest, but they're still vulnerable. Um, lions, again, it's a state of vulnerability, uh, fewer and fewer, fewer than 20,000 left in the world, uh, rhino obviously critically endangered, black and white, uh, wild dogs, massively endangered animals, and then some of the birds you'll find, bataliers, the vultures, um, plenty of endangered animals that we have on this reserve, and not, not ones necessarily that you think of as being endangered because they're quite common on the reserve and in the Kruger Park, but worldwide, hugely endangered. Oh, and of course, yes, you had the ground hornbills with Jamie last night. They're obviously hugely endangered too. Huge amount of work being done on them and their conservation. We've got a great teeming migration here. Baby. And Elizabeth, while we are on the subject of birds, where are the secretary birds? They're around, Elizabeth. We do find them here. They're not very common, but we do see them from time to time. Now, I was trying to roll gently up to these wildebeest and zebra so they wouldn't run away, but unfortunately, Jigger, the car that I'm in, um, is more aged and stiff than an arthritic 95-year-old human, and so she's just ground to a halt. But there's a tiny baby wildebeest in the background there. That one there is definitely very pregnant. Let me just sneak a little bit forward. You'll see the little one. standing ones lying down. You see the one lying down there? It's now being hidden. Isn't it? There. Look at that. Probably newly born two days ago. Oh, get out of the way. There we go. Isn't that sweet? And there's a little baby zebra as well, just in front of us. Mm. Little foal. They're not quite as seasonal breed as the, the zebras. They will generally prefer to have babies at this time of the year, but they're not as seasonal as the wildebeest and impala, which exclusively have babies this time of year. Sneak a little bit forward. I mean, I say sneak, but uh, it's not easy to see. Two baby wildebeest. These are the same two. So they're not too far from quarantine clearings, which is, I think, where they were born. Oh, let's quickly go across to Scott for some displaying antelope. See who's now. I know a lot of you have been asking about the difference between an Inyala, which is an antelope we've seen quite a lot of this morning, and the Kudu, which you are now looking at now. 
And, oh, there it goes. They are very similar. They've both got the vertical wide stripes that no other antelope in this area will have. But the main difference between them is that kudu are uniformly gray. There's one crossing the road in front of us, Brian. That's probably a good option. And both the males and the females are this gray-brown coloration, whereas the Inyala, the females are rusty brown, reddish brown, and the males are a dark chocolate brown. So the main distinguishing feature will be coloration. But size is also very important. Difficult for you to sometimes work out the different sizes. I'm just going to drive forward a little bit. As you are not sure, so size perception can be difficult. But kudu are considerably larger than Inyala. So a far larger antelope, almost twice the size. And this is a very young female kudu we're looking at in the foreground here, and she's probably just about the same size as an adult Inyala. The ears of the kudu are also probably larger, and the tail is less fluffy. The tail of the Inyalas is very, very fluffy. Both beautiful antelope and both parts of the spiral horned antelope family with corkscrewing horns that twist in on themselves. The Inyala, not as corkscrew-like in terms of shape. And the bushbuck, the smallest of the spiral horned antelope in this area, similar to the Inyala, they just twist in on themselves. Sadly, no big males around here, and that's probably because it is not mating season and the male kudus will only lurk around the females when there are opportunities to mate. Unlike the wildebeests, which have got very strict and set mating seasons, the kudu are a little bit more open to giving birth at various stages of the year. And speaking of wildebeests mating and the produce thereof, we are going to send you back to the herd with the cute little calves. So the little baby is laying down and its mother's just laying down next to it too. I think they'll probably rest there for the next hour or so, nice and out in the open where they can see if there's any potential threat coming their way. They also know, of course, that the predators are mainly active. Oh, not happy there. Mother got very protective. Probably a young, ooh, very cross. Look at this, this is fantastic. Mother getting very, very upset. Wonder why. There's another youngster to have a look. I'd watch out if I was that youngster. So, of course, these wildebeests are extremely vulnerable to lions and leopards, mainly lions, though, at this time. So I suspect that's why the mother's sort of sense of protection is so much higher. And I was just saying, they will know, of course, subconsciously, that the lions and other predators are unlikely to be moving around at this time of the day. And that's why it's a good time for them to lie down, have a bit of shut-eye, do a bit of cud chewing. But they don't want to be doing that when the lions are kind of at their hunting peak, if you like. Ooh, she's very cross. That one looks to be very pregnant as well. I think there are quite a few that are still going to drop lambs at some stage during the summer. It should be very soon. They're not quite as synchronized as the Impala are, but they will definitely give birth around about the same time. So just the two so far, but there are going to be others very soon. And that will inevitably attract predators, which is great for us. Not ideal if you're a wildebeest. <clears throat> that little baby, very easy to catch if you're, in a, if you're a lion, or a cheetah, or a wild dog, or even a hyena. Really nice. 
chance to see. Now, this is the same species that you see in those enormous numbers in East Africa, two million of them streaming across the Serengeti Plains. It's just a slightly different subspecies. It's called the, that one's called the brindled gnu, and they've got a white beard, a very definite white beard underneath the chin. These ones, their beard is entirely dark. Let me see if they don't graze out into the open here. Those little ones are already starting to sample the grass. I mean, they can't be more than a few days old, and oh, they won't be eating it too much now, but they're certainly sampling grass already. Um, and we've got the zebra, of course, in front of us as well, and they're often in, in a sort of a, a, an agglomeration with the wildebeest, many eyes, looking for predators, of course, and they eat different lengths of grass, and so they think that's sometimes why they hang around together, uh, zebra eating slightly longer uh, grass plants. And Alyssa, you want to know what subspecies of zebra we get here. Uh, none. Um, Alyssa, we only get one species here, and that is the Birchall's zebra. There's only one subspecies of it that I know of, and that's the one that we're looking at. And so I don't think it's actually been split. There are three different species of zebra that are found in Southern Africa. The Birchall's, the Hartman's mountain zebra, and the Cape mountain zebra. But here, only the Birchall's or Plains zebra is found. Interesting interaction there. Look at this. This is quite interesting. Zebra will kill baby wildebeest foals. Look at that. Not, not yet little ones, but adult. <laughs> adult zebra will kill baby wildebeest if they make a noise. And we'll try and stop them making a noise because they obviously attract predators. Let's see what she does. <coughs> the mare is not very happy. Nice to see the foal frolicking about like that. So we're going to stay here for a little while, and I think we'll send Scott off to the hyena den. He doesn't appear to have too much. No doubt he'll find seven or eight bird nests on his way. But I think he's going to go and check the hyena den. We'll stay here and just have a look what's going on around here. I'll just sneak forward a little bit, see if we can't get a better look at the zebra. Sandra, you make a very good point that I often forget is that how difficult it is to tell scale from the camera. So let's give you an idea of how big these zebra and the calves and the wildebeest are. That little zebra foal uh, is very small. So an adult zebra is like a small horse, uh, bigger than a pony, but a small horse. So if you're a horsey person, about 15 hands high uh, for a big one, uh, that would be the sort of average size of a, of a large zebra. And so if you think of a small horse, that's the same size. Wildebeest about that size too. And they're about as tall as a horse. And they weigh, I mean, a big bull wildebeest will weigh 250 kilograms, which is about 600 pounds. And the little one there is, well, that's just very little. It's the size of would you say about a great dane? Eh? Bien? Mm -hmm. Maybe a little fatter than a great dane. A little fatter than a great dane, yes, but that sort of length, that sort of height. So standing about two feet off the ground. Just born and it's really two feet tall. With powerful legs. <laughs> but obviously very tired. Like all newborns needs to sleep quite a lot. Which is all very well if you're born in a crib and have the safety of a of a home. 
not very safe out here. Teresa, we were talking about this zebra and the different subspecies or sub the different species you get in southern Africa. Um, and you want to know about the Grevy's zebra and do we get them here? The Grevy's zebra, G-R-E-V-V-Y apostrophe S, as far as I remember the spelling, um, is an East African species. You find them in Kenya and they've got they look very different from these. I've always found the Birchall zebra looks more like a, a horse than it does a donkey. The uh, gravy zebra looks a bit like an ass, so it looks like a bit like a donkey with much more closely, um, cl the stripes are much closer together than they are on the Birchalls or the mountain zebras. Definitely though. Alyssa, good one. There's a little foal, and you can see also the long legs, I think a bit older than the wildebeest calf. That one's probably about a month, maybe two months old. Again, already eating grass. <laughs> Every time I think I've heard it all from the different Twitter handles that we hear, we hear, I'm always amazed by another one. Hashtag tropical got jokes or at tropical got jokes. That's your Twitter handle. What a great Twitter handle. You want to know about zebra ancestors and what they are. Um, they're the same as the horse ancestors. They would have split off from the horses, uh, which were eventually, I think, domesticated in... Where were the horses domesticated? I think they were domesticated in Southeast Asia, if I'm not mistaken. I've forgotten that now. It may have been the Americas. But their ancestors would have split off probably... Mm, maybe almost a million years ago, uh, probably 500,000 years ago. But before that, I mean, they started off as, I know the horse ancestors were tiny little mammals about that big with slightly long noses. And then they got bigger and bigger from there and eventually would have split off. Well, they would have become the horses, the wild horses. And the remnants of those live in uh, Mongolia now, the Przewalski's horse. I think they're in Mongolia, somewhere around there. And that would have been the same ancestor that the zebra had. But they would have split off probably almost half a million years ago, I think. And now you've already got the African horse. And the African horse, of course, is not a domesticatable animal. Apparently, almost impossible to domesticate. They're just very, um, very upset. They have show a disturbing propensity to get angry with human beings. And you don't want that from something Ooh, huge action here. Mm. Look at that, little ones. Rich King, you want to know if all animals with stripes have a common link? I mean, I'm assuming you're asking, is there an adaptation for stripiness that is important? Or is there a reason for it? This is a lovely wildebeest sighting. In fact, this is the best one I've had since I've been here. Rich King, the stripes definitely make a difference in confusing predators, especially in woodland areas. Where they're moving quickly, I think the stripes distract predators from the direction in which their potential prey might be moving. So yes, I think that would be the, the common link there. But certainly not biologically. It's, it's an example of what we call co-evolution. And co-evolution is when animals that are unrelated develop the same strategies for survival because of similar environmental conditions. So the wildebeest have got those little stripes. The nyala have got those stripes. Zebra have got stripes. All for the same reason that they've evolved separately. Let's head across to Scott. He's on his way to the hyena den, and he'll keep you updated from there. I think we'll probably sit with this little herd for a little bit longer. Welcome back everyone, and um, we've just bumped into another safari vehicle, he's just up ahead of us, you'll get a glimpse of them shortly, and I was just chatting with them, they have got the same interests as we do, they're going into the hyena den, and because he's right there, I guess we can just wait for him to let us know if there is in fact anybody at home. 
I missed the turn off. I was coming down this road and when I saw him, Abel, with his guests, I got distracted and missed the turn off. Anyway, like I said, rather than going off here, we'll just wait to find out if it is in fact active. Abel, let me know if it's active, please. Safest for us to shoot in quickly and have a look for ourselves, as the radios are very often unreliable. Yeah. I think they're in luck, but there's only space for one of us. So we'll come back another day. The beauty of this is, is that his guests probably don't join us on Safari Daily, so I'm quite happy to leave them here because we have the opportunity to bring you back here another time, whereas they probably will not have an opportunity to come back and see the den in all its glory. So, bad timing, but let's go and look. Everything happens for a reason out here. And maybe we're going to find a leopard around the next corner. because all of the nests that we have been monitoring have been unsuccessful in providing us any glimpses of their little chicks. We've just been seeing eggs, 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 and before the eggs have hatched, they've been consumed by something on various different nests. And what I'm hoping is that we're going to be able to monitor the full growth of some chicks from egg to fledgling to be a wonderful story to tell. But so far, the birds are not having any joy in even getting the eggs to hatch, or at least the birds that we've been monitoring. And maybe that's because I guess if the nest is easy enough for us to find, it's probably also easy for a predator to find. So maybe that's why all of the nests that we have been lucky enough to find have been nests in a ill-suited spot that's easy to raid. Well, I'm very happy to hear you have been enjoying a wonderful sighting with James and a zebra foal. I haven't seen a small zebra foal for quite some time. And the good news is you are going to be going straight back there and enjoying some more cute little stripes. Well, here we are, with, still with the zebras, the wildebeest are behind us, and we're just looking at this little, what we call, kinship group. It'll be a stallion, I think that's the stallion there. No, that's not a stallion at all. Uh, sorry, there, yes, I think that might be the stallion. It certainly seems to be equipped as a stallion, and there'll be one stallion, maybe one or two younger ones, and then his wives, or his harem. That one's got a very itchy leg. But he comes. Let's get back on him. He's now got an itchy bottom. <laughs> it's 
quite interesting stripe marks he's got at the back there. You see where they've kind of split. I wonder if that isn't the result of an old injury, perhaps from a lion claw. Oh, isn't he beautiful? He's in a one in wonderful condition. Shiny coat, mane standing on end. Hmm. Now, what a lovely new question from a new viewer, Melissa McRoy. I don't know that I can answer your question. You want to know how long do the wildebeest and uh, babies and the zebra babies sleep for? Um, I don't really know. I suppose probably, you know, I think the amount of sleep is determined by diet, A, and B, of course, by age. I will just reverse back quickly. Um, I think you'll find that they probably sleep when they're little up to maybe 10 hours of the day. But remember, the sleeping is never sound sleeping like human beings. It's always very much a dozing and then kind of waking up again because you can't be sound asleep out here. If you fall sound asleep, you get eaten very quickly. So I would say about 10 hours a day for the little ones and for the adults, probably six to seven, maybe up to eight. But definitely a herbivore eats, needs to sleep far less than a carnivore does. Much more carbohydrate in the diet, so much more sugar, they need to burn that off. And they need to eat more, they need to be continually eating so they can't sleep all the time. That's quite interesting. Now, we were chatting about earlier about impala babies, and less than 50% of them will see their first birthdays. And Tammy, you want to know what's the statistic for wildebeest and zebra? I think it depends very much on the area, Tammy. In a place like East Africa, where there are so many wildebeest, I think you'll find that a lot more of them get through to adulthood than they do out here. Um, or certainly a little, far smaller proportion will be eaten by predators there than they are here. I'd say no more than 60% of the wildebeest will get through to adulthood and it's been an area like this. And it could be in some years as low as 40%. I'd say the zebra slightly more. I think they're slightly more equipped. Certainly the adults are a, lot, a bit more um, ad adept at protecting themselves from lion attack. But I wouldn't say much more than 60% if that, Tammy. It's one of the problems with being kind of born um, seasonally, but not being not being able to flood the market like those impalas do. It becomes quite easy to pick off the little ones. So in some years, I mean, none of these. In, in some years, you won't get any wildebeest babies that survive. I don't know if you can hear that, but you can hear that chewing from the zebras. Scott's got a violet back starling. Let's go across to him quickly. Now, we saw the female version of this bird earlier on on the safari. They are the exquisite plum-colored starlings. Now, what's interesting here is that it looks like two males could well be competing for one female. So those are two males sitting next to one another. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle ever so slightly. The female... And I think they're looking for good nest sites. They nest in cavities and trees, and they're checking out this marula tree very, very closely for any potential nests. And I guess once they've found the nest, then they'll come and call the lady across and see if she's interested. Or they'll probably fight amongst one another to gain access to whatever cavity they decide on and then try and win over the female. The female, I've just lost sight of her, but she's lurking around in this general area. It'll be quite nice for us to show it to you just to get an idea of how dull she is compared to them. Also bear in mind that this purple color will glow and iridesce far greater when it's sunny in comparison to when it's overcast like it is now. 
Both males are there. Really interesting stuff. The female, I just want to show you quickly, is perched on a tree directly to our left, Brian, at about nine o'clock. Just, yeah, straight on the top of that. Further left, further left, further left. There we go. So look at how dull she is in comparison. No bright colorations and a heavily streaked breast. What I want to try and do, because now that you've seen the female in comparison to the male, is try and get you some closer views of these males. so concerned in one another that I think we're going to get you some great views of them or oh, the ones just on the right oh there we go perfect now we're going to see some oh they're just too quick some beautiful views here we go they looked in this cavity earlier look at those colors awesome are they there is a cavity somewhere in the end of that stump that they are busy having a look at. So clearly, their intentions are good here. They're trying their best, and it almost seems like they aren't too aggressive with one another, which is interesting. And I do remember reading up that on one occasion, two males have been feeding one female. Now, a lot is not known about the birds of the world in terms of the intricate ongoings and who knows maybe these two will as a pair help to win over this female and then raise the chicks together again just an interesting example of how there are kind of no set rules in nature and even though there are likely tendencies nothing is guaranteed now I'm hoping Rather than searching around for a cavity in this tree, they come and find my nest box, which I made. It's not too far from here. We've just driven past it. Or maybe I should think about moving the nest box into this very tree here. Either way, hopefully we'll get some visitors in it soon. But very happy that we have now got the violet back starling ticked off. You can also hear another bird calling. Called a crested barbet. And Adrenaline Rush, I know you were wanting to know the name of this bird. Another name, or the previous name for the violet back starling, was the plum colored starling. So now you've got two names that you can use for it. I'm indifferent because the names just keep on changing. So, whichever name you like, really, you can use. a firm believer in having to go with the new name every time somebody decides to rename them. Hello again, ask me. And you would like to know whether bird calls are strictly to find mates as a territorial. What is it for? And it's a very good question. It depends on the individual. Some of the times it will be to attract mates. Some of the times it will be to ward off other potential competitors competing for territories in one area or comp competing for a nest site. Or other times it could be simply for flock cohesion or keeping track of a partner or other members of the flock. So there'll be various different reasons why birds are communicating with one another. I guess a lot of the time it's similar to us communicating, similar to lions and leopards communicating. Some of the time it will be for territory, some of the time it will be when you're looking for your girlfriend or boyfriend, and other times it will just be general banter or chit chat amongst your fellow species. <clears throat> oh, 
of Carol in Florida has obviously been keeping close tabs on the safaris over the last week or so and has realized that the elephant numbers seem to be dwindling and is wondering where they've headed off to possibly in search of water carol maybe they did head off in search of water but there's more than enough water around here after the rains so maybe it's food and water a combination of the two um, difficult to know exactly why the elephants come and go at any given point in time because we don't know where they are going and what they are getting to when they get there but they aren't territorial and it isn't un, un or abnormal or unnatural for them to move very large distances in search of food and water very pretty bird on our right here oh i stopped not in the best spot That's a bit of a squeeze with regards to framing, but uh, at least you have got quite a close-up view of <clears throat> this very pretty Woodlands Kingfisher with its turquoise blue back. Now, just like the violet back starlings we've just been looking at, they also nest in cavities and trees. And who knows, maybe there is a cavity within this marula tree that they are already nesting in. Great stuff. Sadly, though, it is time for me to say goodbye as the sunrise safari is coming to a close. And it's been a great pleasure having you on board. Thank you, Brian, for your wonderful camera work. Thank you, Thank you Kirsty and Nikki in the final control room. And well done for James for finding you some great things to enjoy whilst on safari with us. He's going to say goodbye now, and we'll see you on the Sunset Safari. There are some virtual starlings, everybody. And also, you may just be able to hear, and we've just seen a yellow weaver. It looks like a southern masked weaver in the top of that tree. In fact, there's a whole bird party going on here. And the bird parties are often evidenced by the southern black tit, which have been flying around here going I'll try and get you a view of one, we'll just nip forward a bit here. A bird party is a kind of feeding frenzy where birds that eat similar things, so in this case insects, come together. Well, weavers will eat insects, they're mainly sea eaters, but a whole lot of birds come together and they move along in a group. like a musk swallow, a rare swallow actually. Look, he's picking up mud for the nest. That's fantastic. See, with a red breast, but also that white chest, the white top of the chest, that's a musk swallow. Them picking up mud? I wonder where they're building. They'll be building a nest in an overhang somewhere, possibly in the riverbeds. Uh, maybe up against a big tree or underneath a big tree and maybe in the eaves of one of the, the lodges. Wonderful. Lots of birds coming out now as the sort of starts to warm and the sun comes out. Scott, I believe, was very big on his bird list today. I'm not really sure what that means. I assume it means that he was spotting lots of birds. We've seen some good ones today. Doves. Let's finish our drive then on this beautiful birch of starling there. They will be nesting around here. Scott, of course, is a brilliant nest finder. And I have no doubt he found even more today, which he will report to me. Right, that's it from us today. Big thank you to Mickey and Kirsten McKinnon Smith in the final control. Oh, there might be a nest here, actually. No, just killing something to eat. You stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. A big thanks to Viam on camera and to Scott and uh, I'm driving with him. I think it was Brian. And we will see you this afternoon at four o'clock. Please stay safe and happy wherever you are. And we'll see you later. Bye bye.